law students, alumni, law firm and corporate houses in a discussion. We also have this as a medium to communicate to our stakeholders our vision and provide a platform of interaction and networking. We hope that this Destination Sibiasis Law School Pune Meetup 2020, which includes a panel discussion, will help us to deepen the industry academia relation and contribute to the preparation of law aspirants in making their choices of the right law school. The Destination Sibiasis Law School Pune Meetup 2020 shall be carried out in two parts. The afternoon leading into the evening will begin with a presentation on Sabiasis Law School Pune and its achievements, a talk on why to choose the best law school, the scope of legal education aspirants, followed by an interaction and question answer session. The second part of the event will be a panel discussion which will be moderated by the director, Dr. Shashikala Gurkur on the subject artificial intelligence and other emerging trends impacting future of legal education. Before we begin the presentation and the video on Sibiasis, we have already shown you the video on Sibiasis Law School and its achievements by Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, the director. Let me give a brief introduction to Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, the director of the law school. She has a teaching experience of over 24 years at NLSU Bangalore, SDM Law College, Bangalore, Manipal Institute of Communication, University College, Cork, Ireland, and she has led Symbiosis Law School Pune since 2007. She's on the editorial board of LexisNexis by Howard, Journal of IPR by CSIR, Law and Policy Journal Dublin, Ireland, Polish Law Review, to name a few. She's a member of the Curriculum Development Committee, Bar Council of India, Academic Council of National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, IAS Yodis Forum, International Consortium of Law Schools, and on the board of many academic and administrative bodies. She is the recipient of the AHRB Fellowship, <coughs> Fulbright Nehru International Education Fellowship, National Merit Scholarship, to name a few of her uh, achievements. An individual with a passion for research, with a large number of research papers and book chapters to her credit, she has been heading a number of research projects, has been instrumental in bringing three major EU projects worth over two crore rupees is to Symbiosis Law School Pune, is working on three minor projects for SIU, she's a PhD guide and has successfully guided PhD students and has who have been conferred PhDs, and she's also a PhD referee in some of the renowned institutions of the country, such as JNU. I now welcome Dr. Shashikala Gurkur on the dais to give a brief presentation on Sabiasis Law School Pune and its achievement on why to choose the best law school and scope of legal education for the aspirants. Good afternoon, dear well-wishers and friends of Symbiosis Law School, Pune. Uh, prospective parents, prospective students, distinguished alumni, esteemed panelists who have come here to share your experience and perspectives, and all other esteemed invitees and guests. Uh, this event was conceived, as Dr. Bindu aptly mentioned, uh, in order to walk to the doorsteps of the stakeholders because most of the time we are very complacent and comfortable in our own zone. We as teachers, we are very happy reading from the books and imparting information but we are at the threshold of a huge uh, human evolution where our students have the similar access and capability to absorb the information but what they need is a perspective. So we thought it's a kind of unlearning and relearning for us as leaders of the team that manages Symbiosis Law School. It's a kind of learning for our alumni and our well-wishers and the parents to choose a good law school or the best law school and also 
a kind of eye opener for what is to be expected in this journey of being a law student and a legal professional, what are the different career options and how does a law school prepare them for such career options which are going to uh, open or unfold for future. Uh, we did a little research for the benefit of new uh, students who walked into the institute after uh, or rather barged into the institution as a matter of right after going through all those processes uh, of proving their metal to enter a distinguished law school. You know, today in India, we have 1,215 law teaching institutions. And to be among the top three or top five consistently from 2000 onwards is no mean achievement. But to retain that standard, we also have to be researching and seeing how the uh, landscape of human operation is changing in the world in India and how our colleagues in the law fraternity, law professional fraternity are responding to these changes. We won't know by being only in the citadel of that knowledge, namely the Symbiosis Law School and being in our chairs. We would only know only when we walk to the portals of distinguished lawyers, offices and law firms. So yesterday was for all of us such education as we were meeting up with these teams. But we thought today we will dedicate to learn from the professionals, speakers like me, uh, Mr. Dubey, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, uh, and uh, some of the distinguished guests who are here from the corporate leadership as well as uh, uh, family law firm, and from the parents and the students, uh, future students, what do they expect from our law school? What are the questions that they have when they are bracing up to crack this uh, national level entrance exam? namely Symbiosis Law Entrance Test. I must share with you that last year we had uh, almost 25,000 applications for the 300 seats that we have in Pune. So, uh, we have the first level of the entrance exam and once you qualify to be among the top 2,000 out of 25,000, we invite you for group discussion, uh, which is not a discussion but more of a personal interaction. And we also have a process whereby you will be proving your writing ability. And then we shortlist the candidates. Now we are competing among many upcoming and already existing private law schools and distinguished national law schools. So uh, uh, today country's demography is 65% youth, you know. Uh, and these 65% uh, population um, do not have uh, top class institutes to meet up these challenges and expectations that they are looking forward to, to be equipped with. Therefore, we thought that it will be a great pleasure to use this occasion also to meet up with those aspirants and to find out what do they expect and also to educate them. So we call it as destination SLS Pune. It's not that the destination is something where you have to travel, it is that destination has come to your doorstep. And we thought we will use this occasion in terms of what are the uh, qualities uh, and traits of a good lawyer? There are good lawyers, you are going to listen to them. Uh, some of the good lawyers are in the audience. Uh, we want to tell you that there is no shortcut to be a good lawyer. We have the pride and the humility to share with you that we have produced some of the best lawyers in this country. And uh, they are still, I mean yesterday, one of my old students uh, from the Bangalore National Law School was telling that our profession is about 50 years of experience, 40 years of experience, 70 years of experience, our own former uh, Professor Emeritus, late Ram Malani. By the time, I mean, he walked into death uh, only with a few days of respite from his profession, probably a few weeks, because till the end he was advising the clients and preparing briefs, sitting late nights. So that is the beauty of our profession. It is a profession where you, as you age, you get more respect you become better. So the grit to withstand the onslaught of time, the temptation of moving away from the hard work and the commitment and the dedication. I remember Mr. J. Malani telling me that this profession is like meditation. You can't quit this. It's like day in and day out you have to be in it. It's, it, it doesn't entertain any other diversion. So there is no shortcut to be uh, uh, to be quitting or to be achieving when you want to be a good lawyer. So you have to have the first quality of being good orator. You should be expressing well. 
both in spoken communication and written communication, which means language is a tool to the lawyer. You, you have to have an inquisitive nature. You have to keep your mind open. You have to have attention to detail. You can't be very brisk in going through the, living through the papers and deriving your conclusion. You have to have a reasoning which is equipped with logic. You have to have that persuasiveness to convince a judge, to convince a court, even to convince your client about your strategy. You have to have the capacity to judge very well and the writing ability, as I told you. The writing ability in, the, in this context is more like logical writing. And the four A's that we talk about, which is your attitude uh, in terms of professionalism. You know, the attitude is not that attitude of arrogance, but it is the attitude of humility coupled with the public service and also the capability to project yourself as someone who is there to solve someone's problem. Aptitude, the aptitude, legal aptitude is a very different kind of aptitude. We think differently. The analytics and the adaptability to the situation. You should be putting yourself in the shoe of the client because professionalism is characteristically empathetic. It's a, it's a kind of a mindset where you walk the footsteps of your client or somebody who has come uh, to you or somebody that you are standing up for as an advocate. So that adaptability and openness is very important. Continuous reading habit. You don't stop reading. You not only read law, you also should be open to reading the current affairs, open to reading the trends because law is, a, the law is not in vacuum. It, it is operating in human life's context. Therefore, openness to read anything, we lawyers are generalists as well. We should not be specificists sometimes, you know, we have to know everything under the sun. So that kind of open reading habit, being techno savvy because today's law offices are, as we are going to discuss more into the advanced technology of artificial intelligence, a lawyer cannot be a good lawyer or the best lawyer without technical knowledge, uh, perseverance as I told you, and emotional and financial intelligence. One is how to spend the money and where to put the money and how to get the money. So financial intelligence in terms of managing money well, uh, even in areas of investment and things like that, you'll have to advise your client and you have to make your law practice a viable option as well. And emotional intelligence in terms of social relations, networking, because a professional cannot grow without good contacts. And the way you manage your time, I mean most of the time we did a little study, the complaints about lawyers is about the way in which they don't communicate, they don't do the follow-up. That's because they are not well organized. So for, to be a best lawyer, you have to have your commitment in terms of time and managing your time well among many clients who want your attention and the courts which, which sometimes may not function as systematically as you function. Now, it is legal career which builds leaders. You look at most um, important leaders of the world, whether it is Mahatma Gandhi or Barack Obama, most of them are lawyers. So today if we are looking at legal career, uh, today's way of looking at legal career has changed. That's why we have this uh, interdisciplinary integrated LLB program, BBA LLB program, BA LLB program. We are preparing students to become masters of niche domains because every human activity, is nowadays going to be organized more in a corporate form. Uh, gone are the days of oral transactions and things like that. So, careers are a plenty once you have the law degree in terms of law firm based careers where lawyers act in terms of an organized law firm or consulting firms, corporates. Their activity there is about drafting, researching, client counseling, consulting, code based work. So there was a time when one lawyer would open an office, take some juniors and uh, would handle the cases and uh, address the litigation needs, etc. Today's law offices are not just restricted, they may outsource the lawyer to conduct their litigation operation. So uh, our idea of competition which we conceived in Mofusil or smaller territories uh, gets more and more widened in terms of collaboration. So we are moving to an era of uh, collaboration from the era of competition uh, and as such our profession does not allow animosity between uh, professionals because it's camaraderie, it's solidarity. Uh, and then we have the era of niche domain specialists, we have solicitors, we have general counsels who represent the government, we have tax heads, we have IP heads uh, within the law firm. So this is how today legal practice as such 
whether it is core based practice or chamber based practice, gets more and more layered and organized. Therefore, to think that a law, law graduate has to go and stand in the court alone, that on, alone as the option, is no more the reality. So there's, a, there's, a, there's this reality which is coming out. So these are the kinds of law jobs that parents can expect. If the parents are undecided on sending their child on, into engineering or medicine or law, we urge that law is a better choice than both of these professions because finally, when these professionals meet with problems, it is we who are going to solve their problems or defend them. So, legal profession is a very powerful profession. The only profession which is mentioned in the constitution. Therefore, uh, a politically powerful position, a legally powerful position can come if your child is in the legal profession. Second type of uh, jobs that uh, law graduates occupy are court based kind of activities which they direct or represent or control. Litigation is one. Within the litigation, we have local arena where advocates represent the client and then we have at the uh, uh, higher level of judiciary in terms of being senior advocates, the standing counsel. So uh, most of these jobs can be uh, uh, benefiting the law graduates. We have prosecutors in uh, criminal cases representing the government side. We have pleaders. We have advocate generals. We have solicitor generals. Advocate on record, attorney generals generals who are representing the government side and who are also the officers of the superior courts. We have judges and judicial service, whole range of judicial service, quasi or uh, quasi judicial service also coming up as jobs. So we have uh, at the uh, local level judges, judicial clerks, you know, two of my graduates are currently serving as full-time clerks on a one-year assignment with uh, Justice Nazir and a recent one with is with another judge. So we have uh, these judicial clerks, uh, fresh law graduates working with the judges. I have one student working with the um, Judge Hari Shankar in uh, Justice Hari Shankar in uh, Delhi uh, High Court, and he is a three-year law graduate. So there is no limit to uh, law jobs. Uh, we have our law graduates working in judicial academy as researchers. Uh, ministerial officers, registrars, court messengers, legal secretaries. Sometimes a law graduate may not want to open a law office. He or she may be specially endowed in uh, running a law office as managers of the law office. Uh, and then we have e-justice experts. You know, Our Indian courts are now being increasingly organized as e-justice system with Justice Locos leadership. We have local courts also being organized in the e-justice network. Government of India has spent a lot of money and the project is uh, an ongoing, it's a work in progress. We have conflict analysts. In, uh, in foreign countries we have now insurance companies and other companies are looking at conflict analysts, interpreters. You know, sometimes retired judges act as arbitrators. Retired judges act as one person commission. Magisterial inquiries are being conducted by them. So there are plenty of opportunities which come as court-based careers and extended careers. The third category which comes within the governmental uh, setup is the civil service. So in civil service, we not only speak about uh, Indian administrative service, police service and foreign service, we have Indian legal service, which is, I mean, we look forward to it being more organized at the government level, at all India level, where judges will be appointed through that, but that has not yet been implemented. But we have Indian legal service in a, in a rudimentary form, in uh, selection through staff selection commission, where the law officers are appointed by selection based on experience at the all India level, and they may be absorbed by the legislative uh, drafting division or parliamentary affairs division of government of India. We also have them serving different ministries as law officers. And then we have Ministry of External Affairs. I have written there MEA. Ministry of External Affairs as legal entity division, where again uh, it is by staff selection commission uh, and union public service commission that these uh, appointments happen. We have UN jobs, UN civil servants most of the time are graduates or postgraduates in international law. We have Indian corporate service where Indian corporate service officers either may be coming through the route of IAS civil service exam or they are separately appointed by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. So these are the kind of jobs which are in the public domain through the governmental uh, departments. Now we have jobs which are coming in a more of uh, other domains. Mm, part of them are in the government uh, funded uh, organizations, but partly they could be in the totally in the private sector or uh, uh, global kind of companies and corporation. So we all think corporate lawyer means somebody who sits in the corporate office, in the corporate uh, law office, uh, 
in the corporate, very big multinational company or national company, there is a legal division and this corporate law officer is sitting uh, and uh, either drafting um, agreements or vetting contracts or solving disputes or advising beforehand how the new project should go on. It's not just limited to that. There are many areas where corporate lawyers are functioning. Within the mainstream law firms, which I mentioned earlier, we may have corporate lawyers. Like yesterday we visited Fox and Mandel. We had their separate division on investment, which is advising the government on uh, investments that are going to come, who are present representing certain uh, companies who would have been uh, outsourced by the government and they are advising them and they are seeing conflicts and non-payment issues, etc. being handled. Even planning how the investment has to be uh, distributed in the country. So, here we need very strong researchers. So here uh, we need fund managers, compliance leaders, those who comply with the corporate affairs uh, guidelines, uh, strategists who guide on how litigation should be handled, how litigation should be prevented, how focus of the business should be, consultants, in-house lawyers, personal administrators. Many companies have HR managers, personal administration managers having law degree, labor officers, public sector uh, uh, units having law officers, like, you know, National Law School entrance exam for LLM uh, qualifies some people to be absorbed into the public sector units as law officers. And then we have legal process outsourcing, which are very big uh, setups uh, where legal work is outsourced from other countries, where uh, office-based uh, online kind of legal advice and compliances are being handled for big companies. So we have such uh, set, uh, set up in India. And uh, uh, these set up are run by a few multinational companies. Legal recruiters in HR team. Companies HR team goes to recruit people. And legal recruiters are always law graduates within the HR team. They may also advise on how to comply with the HR law, labor law, etc. Then IT specialists for litigation. And uh, we have litigation specialists as well. We have fraud investigators. We have asset reconstructionists. Some of my BBLAB graduates are absorbed by big banks and others in order to uh, help them in the asset reconstruction in case of big debt-ridden uh, companies. And then uh, insurance specialists, forensic experts. So do you, did you expect this many uh, law careers coming out of uh, corporate law uh, possibility? Uh, now within this again we have domain-specific experts. So on the whole, these uh, few titles which are captured may convert into hundreds of law jobs within that division. And then we have media and law kind of vertical. There we have specialist reporters, crime beat reporters who uh, do better job if they do the law graduation. We have ombudsman's, ombudsman. Sometimes the retired judges act as ombudsman or an experienced corporate lawyer may be co-opted as the ombudsman who tries to act as an in-house problem solver. And we have law reporting and publishing. You know, today law journal reporting or Manu Patra, etc. are businesses of hundreds of crores. They <coughs> capture the data and they uh, create these databases and then they sell these databases. So one of our students created a small law journal and she is able to do a good business by supplying these journals to law schools and to lawyers. So there are more and more journals coming out in specialized areas like labor law, IP law, you know. Uh, then we have legal videography. So if you are a person who is well versed in law, and who knows where videography is required, which part of the proceeding is to be captured. Abroad, this is a big business. In India also, now you know Parliament is open to public scrutiny. Slowly, Supreme Court also will be open to public scrutiny because with a mature democracy, with younger voters, they would want to know what's going on. So, days are coming where legal videography becomes important. Second uh, thing is, even the police, when they do the Mahasar nowadays, they may um, sometimes take the help of this videography. So videography acts as a very strong evidence. Third is using online way of witness statements and things like that. So courts are moving towards digital evidence kind of approach. So th there also a lot of media knowledge can become handy. Major media houses have uh, uh, legal experts either outsourced from law firms or they may have an in-house counsel. So those are niche domains which are coming up. Uh, even reviewing media reports and uh, editorial conferences could be better served by a law graduate in the team. And then we have research careers, huge research careers coming up. I was told that 
I mean, just now it was mentioned that uh, we got three crore, nearly two crore uh, equivalent funding from the European Union and a few more lakhs from the government of India. That means there is so much of funding that is there if you are pursuing your career in research. I was reading about uh, startup research and other kinds of research. So many funds from England and other places. Within India also a lot of governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations are willing to spend money if you are able to generate good reports. So, the research is good for academics. Today in uh, law schools, if you see in the country, in professorial and associate professor level, we have a vacancy of 20 to 40 percent. So, good researcher, senior professors are lacking in our country, in the law field. And more and more law colleges and law universities are emerging. And secondly, policy advisors. A lot of our students and national law school graduates are slowly moving towards uh, degrees from places like Cornell or Harvard because they want to look at policy advisory job. That is becoming very, very popular in India, except National Law School Bangalore, which recently started this uh, law and policy kind of masters. And Symbiosis Law School, which is a specialization in uh, law policy and governance in LLM, we don't have many law schools focusing on policy specialism. So, uh, one of my students who is a graduate from Cambridge, who is clerking with Justice Nazir, plans to go for uh, policy advisory LLM from Harvard. So, uh, and another student who opened her own NGO, she is from uh, Mysore, she is now almost going to be absorbed in Harvard, Kennedy School of Government. So, uh, there is a lot of popularity of that and for that, research is mandatory. You should have the technique to research. Then we have people like us, we, who are academic leaders. Academic leadership requires research insight. We have analysts, like I was on the Law Commission of India. We had 10 different projects which we were handling with the Justice Reddy as the chair. And we, we were given these assignments and our research skills were the ones which rescued us when we were given that very responsible task. So policy analysts, policy advisors, policy researchers, academic leaders, academic entrepreneurs, like our own symbiosis was established by a law teacher, I mean by a rotten teacher, who was inspired by his brother who was a judge. So, lot of people who want to open new law school could be doing well if they had directors or trustees who were coming from the law field. And then we have coaches. You can coach leaders who are in, like, when a new law school is open and the law school is not meeting the standards of quality, academics and researchers can be coaches to them. You can be administrators, you can be career counsellors for students, like CLAT itself is being run by, CLAT uh, counselling is being run by law graduates. Uh, the career launchers, uh, most of the resources are law graduates. So there is a lot of uh, scope for such jobs as well. And then we have non-governmental organisations which are heavily funded. Today more than uh, three times of India's uh, budget is there in the country as a money which is flowing into India for a lot of social reform and other kinds of non-governmental work. Some of our students have become very successful business entrepreneurs as well. Uh, so, uh, I was uh, hearing about some of the law school graduates as well, uh, law university graduates becoming very successful business entrepreneurs who sold their company for multi-million dollars to Amazon. So, that also has been uh, witnessed now. Because of this orientation and uh, strategy, thinking which law graduation offers them, they are doing very well in that. About social work, I should tell you something. There are many non-governmental organizations opened by law school graduates or where law school graduates are teaming up with social work graduates, which has resulted in very, very successful human rights advisory, human rights interventions. For example, in Gujarat, we have a lady who has run a non-governmental organization, which is helping in domestic violence, helping domestic violence victims. In Bangalore, we had a couple of organizations like that. And I myself have, have started uh, one in Mangalore way back in 1998, which today has the only Kannada language newsletter on human rights of women. So uh, there is a lot of scope there, I tell you, uh, because right-related research is very much missing in non-governmental organizations. So that's about it. Therefore, for you or your kids to choose a law degree, uh, they have to ask three questions. These three friends will decide their interest, their capability and opportunity. For a household which already has an established law practice, it's very easy because the opportunity criterion is there if the child has interest. So, two out of three is strong. Uh, but even if only ability is there and you do not have opportunity in the family, the ability will find its opportunity as long as interest is there. So, first ask your child if the child is interested. If you are interested, that's not going to be the criterion whether the 
the child is interested. If the child is having that calling for justice, which is which is what we call as ability, one of the abilities, the interest in doing good to others, and the opportunity, the opportunity will be created by the law school itself through placement and other uh, training and other opportunities. Through internships, you will be your child will be able to figure out whether the child belongs to one of those verticals which I told you, and they make plan A or plan B, and also that there should be a role model or a particular goal and then choose a mentor in the beginning itself to start going to the law office, start just feel the law office for a day or so, not just uh, going to tutorials and looking at scores, you know, score, uh, in the long run, nowadays it's a fashion, it's very fashionable to say my marks card do not serve my purpose, it is how I am, what I am projecting as an individual, what kind of experience I carry. So I urge that when you make a plan, when the child makes a plan to win, that plan has to be having some goal in mind and some role model and then choosing a mentor who will stand by uh, when there is a confusion or when they are lost. So in the law school, we provide mentors in the form of our faculty who help them in case they are lost or in case they are confused. So the faculty acts as, act as mentors, we provide career mentors as well. Some of the judges act as career mentors for the aspirants in judiciary. Some of the lawyers act as career mentors, some of our alumni act as career mentors. They come back to the college and talk about their own journey, the hardships they have gone through, how they have developed themselves. So, uh, it's very important that two of the people I am quoting, one is a people's activist advocate Prashant Bhushan, who was prepared to defend his client's case without money when another competent lawyer was asking for 13 lakhs in cash before he was going to file the vakalan. So we think that his quote is worth because he has lived that kind of, he has, he has walked the talk. So I quote, do not look at law as a means of making money, look at it as an instrument of, uh, instrument for securing justice to people, um, engage in issues of public interest. One of the great things of being a public interest lawyer is that you come to learn about a large number of public issues from persons who are experts in the field on a one-to-one -one basis, something you could never do otherwise. It's a very rich and rewarding experience, unquote. So definitely our profession is a very rich and rewarding experience. As uh, Th Thomas Jefferson said, study of the law is useful in a variety of points of view. Qualifies, a, I would say, a person, whether man or woman, to be useful to oneself, to the neighbors and to the public. This is always there. A lawyer in the house makes a lot of difference like a doctor in the house. But sometimes it can be difficult as well because knowledge of law can give you uh, wrong ambitions as well. So it's very important how you learn law and why you learn law. Therefore, when you choose a good law school, uh, you will have to check first of all whether this law school is complying with Bar Council standards. What are the Bar Council standards? Uh, do they have in their prospectus the courses that they are going to teach, the program structure? If they are calling it as BBA, LLB, what are the business subjects they are going to teach? What are the, in BA, LLB, what are the humanities and social sciences subjects they are going to teach? Secondly, uh, academic excellence. What are the academic excellence? So first is Bar Council standards. In Bar Council standards, minimum standard is there are compulsory subjects. Within the compulsory subjects, we have theoretical subjects, we have clinical courses as well. These clinical courses are drafting, ADR, then uh, professional ethics, etc. So you have to ask the question whether this law school is projecting its program structure in its website or in the prospectus that you are going to get when you apply as a student. <laughs> Second is academic excellence. In academic excellence, we have got certain parameters. Whether the students are made to study, because our profession, I told you, the trait is, you cannot be tired of reading. And in our profession, perseverance is a very important quality. So, uh, Ramjit Malani, I remember one evening, we were visiting his house because we were doing some project with him. <coughs> At 7 o'clock in the night, he was keeping a whole volume of P.G. Woodhouse, which is literature. And he always said that, uh, for the lawyer, language is a tool, so you have to be always updating yourself and engaging yourself in reading. So whether that law school engages you in study, how can the law school engage you in study? Offering you number of add-on courses, number of uh, what we call as uh, um, specialized courses, guest lectures, uh, research projects, internal assessments, live projects with the industry. So these kinds of things, you will have to ask such questions. And then, Academic excellence is also about the qualified faculty. It is about the infrastructure that they have, whether there are rooms for students to sit and study, whether the library provides for databases. Many law schools run with one database and then one print set of uh, uh, all
All India report case reports. Today, no case is just about India. There are many Commonwealth cases being supporting our judges' decisions. There are many US cases, British cases, based on which our judges arrive at decisions. So whether the library is equipped with this American jurisprudence, is it equipped with Commonwealth law reports, whether there are databases of global standards, so ask these questions. And how is the course content? Is the student made to do internal assessments as well, or only termed examination? And then is the student engaged in moot court exercises? For example, if a student, if a law school says that if you're interested, you can do mooting, then that's not a good law school. It has to be that right from day one, the student is treated as a, as a mature individual who is prepared to undertake this journey to think like a lawyer. So how is the training process? You ask them. And then, practice readiness. Does the law school prepare them to be practice ready? Does it give them mooting exercises, mock trial exercises? Does it give them good structured internships? How to conduct the internship? What to expect? Uh, internship reports, internship presentations, is it run in that law school? Where, where are the alumni of this law school? Where are they placed? How many of them are in uh, leadership positions in law firms? How many are doing well as litigation lawyers? How many are recognable names in uh, law scholarship? or in the judiciary. And then, the, how is the peer group? If you go to that law school, will that law school have only Canada speaking kind of crowd? Will it have any kind of other kinds of exposure? How many foreign students are studying? Your kid is studying with how many pan-Indian students? How many international students? How many top class students come there? So, if you are among the top 10 law school, the peer group that you can expect is among top 100 best in the country or top 200 best in the country. Because only the top 40, 50 are absorbed in national law school and the rest of them go to these kinds of uh, 3, 4, 5 kind of law schools. So, what is the kind of peer group? Are they competent? Because if you are in the company of the mediocre, you will remain mediocre. If you are in the company of those who challenge you, in the beginning you may be intimidated. But later on you will see this is not, no human being can be better than the other human being. It's only that they have practiced and they have put their abilities to test. So it, it challenges you, it pushes you uh, in terms of your boundaries. And what is the kind of faculty? Some law schools run with two full-time faculty and 20 visiting faculty. And then uh, practicing lawyers come and they do not bother if what they have taught has reached the student. Because they are only visiting. So a uh, full-time faculty is the one which sees if the student has absorbed if the student is able to perform, uh, has uh, developed those uh, traits and qualities. So it's very important to go to a law school, which has got good number of full-time faculty, facilities. Is there a culture of preparing for the profession in the, in the sense of proper corporate uh, and career development programs, structured placement activities and training programs? What is the ranking of the law school? In uh, um, All India level, Ministry of uh, Human Resource Department has done this NIRF ranking than uh, leading newspaper rankings, like the, like the India Today Nielsen ranking, which is the most reliable ranking, because Nielsen is a statistical firm which advises India Today. Now, uh, you have to understand that in India, there are more than uh, 60 to 70,000 law graduates joining the profession. There must be bigger numbers who do not join the profession, but go for higher studies as well. And then, uh, Mm, India is also surging in terms of international trade. One of the experts yesterday told us that 20,000 crores of investment are uh, waiting to come to India. We don't know how much of it will come to Bangalore or Bombay or Delhi, but that is the figure that is there which is being contemplated. There is a lot of integration of economies, you know, transboundary integration and globalization. So, uh, our Indian legal profession needs to be uh, well aware of this. Therefore, you have to send your child to a law school which trains them in these things or which gives them opportunity to be uh, ahead of other uh, graduates or peers. So if you look at uh, Symbiosis Law School, uh, it has all the qualities, I can promise you, which I mentioned in terms of the best law school. So first advantage we have, you saw the background film, it is located in the Symbiosis banner, which has got branded Management Institute and Computer Science Institute and now uh, medical college is coming up. So our vision and mission are more about quality education. We aim at excellence. We are talking in terms of continually recurring excellence. It's not one time excellence and resting on our laurels. It's about recurring excellence. And it's about our global vision. It's about the 
distinction of being in a multidisciplinary context, unless na unlike national law schools, which is unidisciplinary context, we have this uh, creating global competency, cross-cultural sensitivity, because we look at international world as one family, we look at value-based learning, we look at creating knowledge and disseminating knowledge, as Dr. Bindu said, we are going to have that uh, video in front of you, where we won two laboratories awards from Herbert Smith and Three Hills, which is the topmost law firm in the world, because of my engagement with the deprived prisoners of Pune and women of Pune. So, uh, we have uh, health and wellness students are supposed to be undergoing a mandatory course on wealth and health and wellness. So, they are exposed to the gym. We have a gym on the campus and we have gym trainers. There are many law schools which have the gym, but do they have trainers is the question you have to ask. So, students have the option of going for the, uh, for the uh, range of physical activities. We emphasize a lot on yoga, contemplation, and uh, value-based education and uh, every student gets the opportunity to participate in community legal service. So our law school is uh, courageous in terms of being the pioneer in experimenting with BBLLV. We were one of the first to start BBLLV program and today we have upgraded it as honors program. We were one of the first three in the country to start one year LLM program and if you look at us we are also courageous and the first in terms of one of the only law schools to internationalize the curriculum, uh, to look at uh, the best practice of bringing an American expert to teach how to think like a lawyer and voting and legal writing. Our curriculum is very, very comprehensive in order to create a job-ready or profession-ready student development. Our research and publication are at both global and national level in leading Scopus-based journals. Second is, we have sustained, sustained excellence. Whether uh, when we were created in 1977, uh, how we were in the Pune University's affiliation, and today when we became autonomous as a deemed university's constituency, how we are moving, we have made the sea of care in ethics, we and compassion, practice as justice defenders in courage, expertise in terms of the competence we create in students, and professional identity in terms of collaboration. Most of our assessments also are in team assessment because we believe that. Standalone profession is moving into collaborative kind of reality. Um, today's lawyer cannot uh, work as a single individual. So uh, we also go at uh, world recognized brand kind of identity where we have students coming from outside India. Some of our summer uh, or short term program, German and other students have come back to do masters with us by liking our excellence. So I'm just giving you a bird's eye view of the journal that we handle. The number of students, we are almost 2,000 students as on today, our total numbers in the law school, spread around a variety of programs. As I told you, the three-year LLB we revived in 2013 has now come to be one of the most uh, reckoned kind of programs, serious programs. So we attract MBAs, we attract CAs, we attract company secretaries. So um, that's about it. And then if you look at our world-class approach, we were the first to start European Union Legal Studies program. Today we have Gujarat replicating it and Jindal replicating it. We started way back in 2010. And our collaborations now, we have crossed 50. And uh, we have memberships in international associations. On an average in every semester, we'll have four to six international scholars teaching with our teachers in the classes who come from all over the world. And our students have done internships abroad and at least two to seven students per year go abroad for a semester. Aside from large number of students going for summer schools and short programs. So you will see that our curriculum is developed after engaging stakeholders, some of them are speaking today, engaging in policy and legal education reform in teams, ensuring admission of best students as I told you, entrance test and then personality test. And then structured feedback we get from students from time to time on how our services are reaching them. Some of the parents are here, you can verify how uh, they are heard and their wards are looked after. So we have wide variety of electives for students because in honors program, compared to the regular LLB, you have six extra courses that student has to study. Student can opt for these courses as a specialization basket or they can choose from a uh, range of courses. And we have at least 50% of the students placed via the campus. Rest of them choose their family-based uh, vocation or they go for higher studies. And then uh, some of the dream impact that we have had uh, is shown in these quotations. One student who talked in the University of Oxford said that it's because of the uh, training that he went through in Symbiosis Law School. He did it in, uh, 
as you see there, law and finance. Some of our students have gone to Geneva for this specialized course because there is increased fitment between law and finance when there is so much of business investment. So that's what you see here. And then there is another student who qualified to the New York bar. And the entire process of his training was monitored by us through our friends in New York judiciary and New York bar, uh, local uh, people, by uh, our collaboration. And then we have some of the glimpses of how international people are engaged in our day-to-day -day activities and some of the leading universities from Japan, Australia, Germany, etc. coming here. So we have always been innovative. We don't stop innovating in terms of uh, our legal education to create practice-ready and job-ready lawyers. Uh, we also respond to average learners and advanced learners by providing these opportunities and all-round personality development. There's mandatory moot in the five moots in the life, life, life cycle of the student. There is a simulation of the boardroom of a corporate office where education will help students. If you look at my faculty, we have experts in management, foreign language, journalism, humanities, industry, and international exposure. This number has gone up because now we have the, uh, as you know, now we have the European project. So almost uh, more than 60% of my faculty has had experience of teaching abroad. Uh, so these are some of our mentors, including Professor Bakshi, Professor Jain, and uh, late Ram Jekmalani, and Justice Lokur, and late Madhavinan. All of them have been on our boards, on our advisory. Sitting Judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, also has been a parent as well as stakeholder in our institute. Um, so we ensure job readiness by creating courses with the law firms or with the corporate houses so that what skills and knowledge they require flows into the curriculum uh, as add, add on course or value add program. So this is what we do. We have a very elaborate induction program where uh, all these experts will come and tell students we have the offerings for you and then the students have the choices. And then uh, if you look at our alumni profile, we already have two high court lady judges and uh, I have one more judge getting into the league now. Uh, Mr. Party, Justice Party, and we have 30 lower court judges all over Maharashtra and Assam, Gujarat, etc. Uh, partners in leading law firms. There was a survey which showed that large number of leadership roles are handled by symbiosis alumni compared to other law schools. So there is a lot of leadership orientation that we give in our training process. And then uh, leadership positions as deputy mayors and civil servants also has been there. We have a uh, lot of our alumni in Indian revenue service as well. Uh, some of the students have been pursuing LLM, some are doctoral researchers, some are academics in lead universities of the country. Uh, our own in-house faculty, more than 10% is our own alumna. Uh, so employee testimony, for example, Dr. Kiran Bedi's in NGU had a very young student of mine going and researching. He was in the second year. And the excellence of his research made her give this testimony. Uh, our recruitment profile also, large number of students choose to go to law firm. And then uh, uh, another substantial number goes to co corporate in-house uh, council jobs. And a smaller number, relatively smaller number goes to higher education and others. But I must tell you that we are not in the business of churning out only for corporate houses. And nobody remains permanent in any of these jobs. They usually have fun in getting back to litigation. So uh, once they pay off their student loans or financial obligations, after two or three years, they migrate into higher education and then they get into litigation or they get into research jobs. So this trend has been very strong in our law graduates. And generally, law graduates do not remain in one domain, uh, uh, one kind of job all the time. They gather these skill sets and remain dynamic and they choose what makes them balance their lives because sometimes law firm jobs can be very, very dangerous to their personal life and personal health. So some of them who don't have that kind of threshold, they move about. Therefore, these figures are only about recruitment process and recruitment <coughs> outcome, but they are not a telling comment on where our products go. Like, for example, Justice Revti Moitide, one of the prominent judges in Mumbai High Court, our old student, she gave the judgment on Haj, the, um, Haji Ali Darga women entry. She gave the uh, very uh, controversial judgment on a builder in Pune engaging in corruption. So she. Uh, started from our law school as a government leader, then she took a break and did her master's in Cambridge, came back, engaged as a litigation lawyer, and then she was absorbed in the judiciary. So nobody remains in one job for very long. Uh, three to four careers they make in order to gather that kind of skill sets 
and then they start in the passion of litigation. This is how most of the graduates do. And uh, this is the right place to study in 21st century because we focus on 21st century skills in terms of support services, e-learning and IT resource. Uh, this is the right place where the right company is there because we have a lot of personal enhancement and development uh, process which is ensured as you see there. Our induction program is very elaborate. We also have outdoor induction. We have career counseling and career mentoring and career path identification and orientation through our alumni and our mentors. And then we have resume writing workshop, training in diverse career, developing the CV, learning management system which we have which tracks the student development across five years and the soft skill development which we have emphasized. There's a mandatory course on soft skill because we have come on the research uh, which CAs have incorporated in their annual, I mean in their all India level curriculum that 85% of the success in profession depends on soft skill more than the hardware of knowledge that you have. So we have a student advisory board where our students have parallel kind of setup whereby they assist the governance system and administration of the college and in the process they train to become full rounded individuals. Uh, we provide uh, financial assistance garnered through generous donors as well as government of India and then uh, we balance the institutional social responsibility activity. You will see there that our community outreach program have had these kinds of beneficiaries Every year we collaborate with the District Legal Aid Services Authority to solve at least 40 to 50,000 cases in Lok Adalat, aside from our continuous program in 27 villages surrounding our university. And uh, we have ongoing program with the prison, with the deprived, uh, disadvantaged communities of Pune. Um, some of our programs have been documented and we have won an uh, uh, award for that, which we have again plowed back to the beneficiaries in the prison and other places. So you have some of the glimpses of our activity in training the personnel. Our first legal aid clinic which Dr. Menon inaugurated in Kiringwood village. We have had two more clinics and now those many villages under our fold in our work. And then uh, we balance the ISR activity uh, as I showed you already. Uh, so just to summarize why it is the right place, SLS Pune as the best law school uh, based on all the criteria I told you, because of the reputation, because of the flexibility, the training that we give you in a very rich interdisciplinary environment, uh, state-of-the-art infrastructure, best practices garnered and gathered from all over the world, comparative advantage in terms of a multidisciplinary context and in the company of the best management institute in the country, and contribution to, I mean in the private sector, contribution to legal education as a leader, you don't see many law schools engaging especially in the private sector in these kinds of uh, reputed roles. I have already told you this, I think, so I won't repeat it. Therefore, uh, now uh, it is up to you whether uh, you want to join a law fraternity which is so professionally managed and give the opportunity to your ward as a parent, as a lawyer and as a legal professional and as a corporate leader, how you could help us. We leave it to your reflection and thank you for the opportunity to share such a glorious journey with you. Thank you, one and all. And I'm sure the moderator will tell you that we have a, a little break at the end where we can discuss. There is a question and answer after our uh, panelists as experts will give their views on the topic that we have kept for discussion. I think Nirupama is here. We will be waiting for her. Yeah. Thank you. Either it is going to be an NLS panel or it is going to be symbolics. Otherwise, she has already decided that she would take a break again to, you know, come back to police symbolism. So I'm, I'm proud to say that here. Uh, my question to you is that uh, if we have, uh, you know, she will have to be prepared for her entrance. When would be the entrance? And is there any um, course wherein they can join, you know, because every course is not um, similar to the other. Uh, so is there any course which is conducted by some voices to give this entrance exams for law? Uh, thank we you. do not. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, our entrance exam is going to be announced uh, on, uh, uh, I mean, by this weekend, uh, we will have official publication. 22nd, uh, if you go into our website, and university is uh, set, that is uh, Symbiosis Entrance Test uh, website, which is the secretariat of the university. <coughs> Uh, which is managing it, uh, you will have information about that. Now, uh, the test will have uh, 150 questions, 
which are to be answered in 150 minutes uh, for 150 marks. So these questions are divided into segments, analytical ability, logical reasoning, language comprehension, and general knowledge, and then we have legal reasoning. So 30 questions in each of the segments, and these are multiple choice questions, and the student, we don't have negative marking for wrong answers. So how do you train the student? We don't officially have any course or any orientation on how to train for the examination because it is a level playing field and the students are opting all over the country. Ethically, it could be conflicting as well if we are enlightening parents on, uh, 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 I mean, if we are conducting an official course or support any coaching center to conduct this course. Therefore, it's a very ethically sensitive matter. Just like CLAT conducts, you know, courses. I just wanted to know particularly where to get into Zimbabwe. Oh, you mean to say that yes. CLAT entrance exam? Yes. Yeah, those are run by private providers. Uh, so we have no collaboration with them or orientation to them. They go by uh, retention tests of their candidates who come and attend our examination and based on that they coach them. Officially, we don't give any coaching. And on our website, certain question papers as model question papers have been made available. They will be made available. You could access them, ma'am. Otherwise, there is no uh, authenticated or officially sanctioned coaching or orientation program that we conduct. We urge the parents to visit the institute. There are many uh, guide uh, books available, which some parents may use of, but we won't officially recommend any. What is the good time to visit or is it open any time? It is open any time. Okay. Even if the students are not learning post-semester, our faculty will be there, our administrative team will be there. We'll be happy to show you the infrastructure. Thank you. You can also talk to some of our students who are in the audience later on in the uh, informal part of this uh, session and ask them how did they prepare, how did they get in? Because they also made it among thousands of students. And uh, Parallels between national law entrance test and us, the Jindal entrance test is uh, through the American uh, examination, LSAT India. There are, uh, uh, there is a 80 to 90 percent similarity between us and Bangalore law, I mean all the national law school CLAT exam. But if you look at the LSAT exam, we are only 50 percent similar to them because there they are looking at logical reasoning and language. Whereas we also look at numerical dimensions through analytical reasoning and analytical ability, and then uh, legal reasoning. So the preparation will be uh, in tandem with that, which these coaching classes have somehow been monitoring and they are preparing candidates for. Uh, that's all I have to submit to you. Yeah, anyone Thank else, you. please? Thank you. For giving a very fair information on the scope of legal education, on how to choose a good law school, and to give a good glimpse of what Symbiosis Law School stands for and uh, after having seen the presentation you could make your choice as to whether Symbiosis is one of the destinations that you want to keep for your students or for your goals. Uh, as we move to the next session which is uh, the panel discussion, I would request Dr. Gurpur to felicitate our panelists who are there amongst uh, the audience. Emerging trends impacting future of legal professions. And before, as I said, before we go into it, let me invite Madam to felicitate our panelists. We have with us Advocate Neeraj Dubey, who's the partner of Lakshmi Kumari and Sridharan at Ali's Bangalore. Thank you very much, ma'am. May I now request you to felicitate our next panelist, Mr. Manukul Karni, who's the partner at Puvaya and Company. Thank you very much. Ma'am, I, I, I also request you to felicitate our third panelist, Ms. Nirupama Jaisimha, Regional Legal Counsel at Google, West Asia and India. I now request you to felicitate Mr. Shravanth Arya. Mr. Shravanth Arya is a very bright alumni of Symbiosis Law School, Pune, 
and a legal practitioner who has worked with renowned law firms such as AZB and also with Povaya and Company. I would also like to put on record the great support that we have received from Mr. Sharon in coordinating this event, getting us connected to some of the very best in the industry and also for the continued support that he has been extending even after leaving the portals of Symbiosis Law School Pune. We will now begin the much-awaited panel discussion on, an, uh, on artificial intelligence and other emerging trends impacting future of legal profession. Before I invite our panelists on the dais, along with the moderator for the evening, Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, let me introduce the panelists who will occupy the dais today. We have with us Advocate Neeraj Dubey from Lakshmi Kumarun and Sridharan attorney, uh, Attorneys, Bangalore. <coughs> He's a partner and head corporate and commercial division. Mr. Neeraj Dubey is a corporate lawyer with around 15 years of legal experience and comprising vast gamut of business laws, contract management, labor and employment, regulatory compliances, and technology law. He routinely counsels manufacturing and service industry companies on a vast range of day-to-day -day corporate and regulatory compliances in all elements of commerce and business, including contracts, corporate governance, competition, labor and employment, health and safety, and regulatory compliances. Mr. Dubey assists in legal due diligence, audits, structuring of business, entry into India, setting up of compliance systems, drawing paperwork, contracts, and trainings. So, industry focus spreads across automobile, aviation, banking, chemical, defense, energy, food, pharmaceuticals, information technology, and waste management. Sir is a very regular in conferences as both speaker and as a moderator. A law graduate from Delhi De uh, School, University of Delhi, he's also a trained mediator. Thank you, sir, for joining us as one of the panelists. We have amongst us our next panelist, Mr. Manukul Karni, who's a partner at Puvaya and Company. Mr. Manukul Karni is a third generation litigation lawyer with a significant experience in arbitration and dispute resolution practice. He is the partner <coughs> leading the dispute resolution practice at Puvaya and Company for the last three year, few years. Having worked as a partner in Common Law Chambers and as an associate in Amarchan Mangaldas, Mumbai, he had cemented uh, this, it has cemented Sir's core expertise in commercial litigation and arbitration. Sir regularly appears before multiple judicial and quasi-judicial fora in Bangalore and New Delhi, including the Supreme Court of India, the High Courts of High Court of Karnataka, at NGT, NCLT, DRAT, DRT, City Civil Court, Sessions Court, and Magistrate Courts, Debt Recovery Tribunals, State Consumer. Dispute Red, uh, Redressal Commission and Arbitral Tribunal. Sir is an alumnus of Nalsar Hyderabad and has graduated with a gold medal in jurisprudence. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. We also have with us our third panelist, Ms. Nirupama Jaisimha, who is an associate in the tele who, who is with Google and uh, looked after the telecom media tech legal team at Tri Legal. Uh, she's an LLM from Stanford University and a law graduate from Bangalore University. She has had a brief stint with Infosys and she has also worked at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us over here. I welcome all the three panelists on the dais, and now I call upon Dr. Shashikala Gurpur to take the floor as the moderator and begin the panel discussion. Good evening, uh, my esteemed uh, audience. Uh, uh, so we are going to deliberate on uh, a very, very important phenomenon of our times, artificial intelligence in the coal and other emerging trends in legal profession. We expect this discussion to educate the current law students, some of them are here, uh, 
to enlighten the senior and other practitioners who are among the audience as friends of symbiosis and also uh, to, uh, as a matter of scholastic interest, what is going to be the future. So, first of all, uh, the kind of artificial intelligence impact that has been there on the legal profession has been this famous, uh, the legendary dimension of IBM Watson, um, who is able to gather thousands of cases and is able to even frame a judgment or a legal opinion um, as, a, as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, cyborg, I mean, a parallel human being, a parallel to the lawyer or parallel to a legal researcher. Another impact that artificial intelligence has had is, aside from the core legal competency uh, of the human type being challenged or human type being supplemented with IBM Watson, we have another phenomenon of uh, this kind of big data and the working of the big data through the artificial intelligence resulting in questions posed about confidentiality, about privacy, about information security or data security as well. Um, the third is uh, the um, idea of transnational uh, reality because the very emergence of artificial intelligence has been a step forward from the earlier phenomena of uh, cyber uh, phenomenon or uh, information technology per se, internet, all of them being uh, also uh, being fused into the frontier technologies such as nanotechnology and other things. So, uh, as the moderator, uh, coming from the academic uh, side, having successfully uh, led uh, a project on artificial intelligence and law as a, as a kind of, uh, I mean, it's a work in progress, uh, as a kind of research attempt, and a lot of human rights dimensions being added to it in terms of, you know, for example, what if this data does not identify um, a face which comes from non-white world, what we call as biases in technology. Um, and not able to align uh, the data which is not uh, being fed by the programmer uh, who has certain human biases about certain data, uh, how, what is the guarantee that it is going to serve its purpose? So such questions have been uh, confronted by uh, us also when we were doing the research, uh, when we were de deliberating on that as an academic subject. So I would start with uh, Ms. Nirupama uh, who comes from the uh, technological uh, law kind of background uh, hard in the core of it to lay open uh, the issues and uh, also the challenges and the promises that artificial intelligence holds for legal profession. Over to you. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, because uh, given that you know there were to be prospective students and uh, uh, you know current students, I thought you know we could deliberate on how we could or how the uh, educational institutions and law students could actually think about artificial intelligence and what they could do, what approaches they could adopt uh, to. So that's the focus, and um, that's what I'm going to speak on. So if you think it's appropriate, I, I'm happy to go last. Uh, if you want to put out the challenges and issues, and then I can suggest the approach, or do you want me to start with the approach? Okay, then let us see how the practitioners are working yeah. with it. Oh, sure. Yeah, that could come as a response. <laughs> Hi. So I'm comfortable here. I'll sit and speak. So there are two very key aspects. One is value judgment and creative thinking. And these two aspects are missing from the AI, which makes us lawyers different from them. And at the end of the day, we should always remember that AI is a tool to help us work more efficiently and effectively. And we with our creative thinking, or the engineers who are working on the engineering aspect of it, 
would create generations of AIs for us to work more efficiently. So, I don't see this as a challenge. The challenge, of course, starts for students. Because what it is going to do, it is going to take away a lot of the entry level jobs. Because those tools will be more efficient in dealing with the mundane work, the research, the basic template drafting, the <coughs> research that you do for uh, your seniors. So at the entry level, you'll see a lot of tools being used. Now we, we of course need people to use those tools. So there will be decrease in the number of people in terms of more usage of the software, but the counter argument which I feel and I'm seeing in my office is this will give the seniors flexibility to approach more and more people. From seven, eight offices, now we have 12 offices. And we are further expanding, we'll have 18 offices in 2020. So we are reaching out to now satellite towns, smaller cities. How, how is this possible? By more and more usage of technology. And now AI also is playing an important role in our firm. We have also started using it. So we have not only lawyers, but we have a pool of more than 100 engineers and scientists who work for us. They work in patent division, they work in engineering division, and they help us in meeting this bridge. Because as lawyers, I when I studied, there was no use, greater usage of technology. And from Delhi University, we were not taught on computers, we had seminars, we had a lot of discussions, right? And when I started working, my first job was to sit and work in a laptop. So the only thing that was, I was asked in the interview, whether you know MS Word, and that was fine. <laughs> so, but now that is not sufficient. You need to know a lot of other things. You know, need to know a lot of search engines, how they function, because no law firm or no organization is uh, going to teach you that. So, it is incumbent on law schools to provide those kind of trainings. So, again, entry level uh, issues that lawyers will face, the pressures will face, only law schools can train them to be a better candidate for law firms or in house. So, uh, Neeraj, you have raised a very important issue of how, instead of looking at AI as a challenge to the profession, you are uh, uh, suggesting that it is going to improve the efficiency of the profession and outreach of the profession. Uh, something similar is uh, predicted in case of medical profession as well. Uh, for example, there, you know, a lot of these medical graduates do not want to do their internships in villages uh, or posting also in the villages. Everyone is aiming to be in big cities, working in multi-national uh, hospitals uh, in a very regulated kind of work condition. So. Uh, they are thinking that uh, artificial intelligence is going to be, uh, in a way, uh, serving this unmet need uh, uh, of the healthcare of such deprived population. So, do you mean to say that AI is going to increase the outreach of legal profession as well, uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 reaching, uh, in terms of outreach? Uh, um, and in what other ways will it impact uh, legal profession? I mean, apart, apart from expanding your profession, what about the quality of service? For example, you pointed out that uh, we can have a uh, uh, lot of data, a lot of content, but we it cannot replace human being. My challenge is to you is, will IBM Watson be able to give the empathetic consideration which a lawyer, senior lawyer will give in case of a family dispute, for example? What is your, I would like to know more about that and then I'll move to Kulkan. No, AI won't work on the basis of facts that is fed into the system, right? So, all the analytics that will happen will be on the basis of the facts. If those facts were, in various uh, cases, were kept into consideration, yet a different judgment had come, using the conscience of law, using the value judgment of the judge who was sitting there. So, all these aspects, to my view, will not be useful for AI because they'll work on 
hardcore data and hardcore information. So that's why when I started, I said creative thinking, value judgment, only humans can do. You can't teach AI that. Maybe tomorrow you can. So that would be a real threat then, but not at this point of time. Now, in terms of uh, the uh, positives, again, at the entry level, a lot of time goes in training people. And the chances of error, if you're doing due diligence, if you're drafting documents, if you're drafting same agreement for the third claim, the aspects of copy-paste. So all these things lead to a lot of errors. And seniors at the middle level or senior level, they spend a lot of time in these mentoring processes. Now this will go away if we start using more and more AI tools. Right? But that does not mean that mentoring process will go away. Because if you stop mentoring, you won't have those middle level people and senior right, as efficient as they should be. So that will continue. But the other aspect that would be important here is to help them teach how to make use of these AI tools so that they can learn and work in a more efficient way. Now, reaching out to more and more audience, more clients, in more cities is, is definitely a, a good thing for the law firm business or even for in-house people wherein they can use tools and they can minimize the number of people that they have in the team. So, from a cost perspective, it's good for them as well. But for law firm, it's business opportunity. That's how I see this. Okay, very good. That's a business opportunity because uh, there is going to be the whole innovation field which is going to be geared to suit to AI or to be complementing AI or building on, the, drawing on the strength of the AI. Uh, so, we will have a lot of uh, IPR related developments coming up, innovation related developments coming up and law will necessarily be a support system there. Now, taking the cue from your point that there will be uh, a need for training the new law uh, uh, workforce or new human resource in the legal field emerging out of law schools or who are already in the profession in this uh, arena of AI. Uh, yesterday, Adhavi Kulkarni was telling me also about uh, how uh, the, the empathy factor is playing an important role uh, where uh, no machine can uh, replace but there is also a kind of good lawyering which is required. So would you like to reflect, critically reflect on uh, what are the emerging trends in our profession uh, and how does AI fit into that or how will AI change that? Two very significant statements have been made yesterday and today about artificial intelligence and the law. Yesterday by the present Honorable Chief Justice of India on how artificial intelligence is not only here to stay but has to be used by the legal system. And earlier this morning at a felicitation function, Honorable Chief Justice, former Chief Justice, Justice M.N. Menkata Chalaya. Now, this month, what was said yesterday has been reported in the papers. What he told us this morning was, he says, in five years, you will begin to see the impact of artificial intelligence in the law. And he says, in your lifetimes, you won't imagine the kind of, you cannot today imagine the kind of changes that AI will do to our lives as lawyers, let alone human beings. Now, to me, the predicate is fairly straightforward. As technology plays a greater role in our lives, artificial intelligence, which is but one facet of this technology, will inevitably have to play a role in the lives of us as lawyers or law professionals. Now, what would that translate into very broadly? Those portions of lawyers' jobs which are data intensive, so I was, look, I have spoken to lawyer, uh, lawyers in large law firms, I have spoken to general counsels, I have looked at the internet on what's going on and data intensive work, people are choosing to go with machines and I think the trend will only increase. That is, when there are large number of files, 
they have to be processed. <coughs> then machines, I am told, are coming in handy. So I ask this practical question to somebody as to how, if that were to be uh, adopted, what about mistakes? So I, there was a very beautiful answer. What about mistakes that we commit as humans? So while a machine may not understand a legal nicety that uh, me as a human lawyer will understand, what about uh, sheer negligence or boredom or having to work late in the night and therefore something obvious has missed the eye? So therefore, uh, machines will bring uh, greater objectivity, machines will bring more efficiency, but yes, with their own pitfalls. But to me, the writing on the wall is clear, it is inevitable. And like in every man versus machine or human versus machine uh, saga that has been going on since the onset of industrial age, jobs will be lost to machines. Now, comes the question of how far will AI go? So I thought I will demonstrate that as to where possibly AI today, in this day and age, I still cannot imagine how AI may be able to respond to a situation such as this. So if you permit me, I will take two minutes to read out the statement of a very famous accused in a real life trial and the reaction of the judge. I will not tell the name of the accused or the judge right away. I will, once I have read out those statements, the objective of this exercise is to see how AI would process the statement of an accused and impose sentence and how the judge did it in this case. It's a famous trial. I will not take more than one and a half to two minutes in reading this out. I have timed it. So, this is the statement of the accused. This is a trial for sedition. Before I read the statement, I'd like to state that I entirely endorse the Advocate General's remarks in connection with my humble self. I think that he has made, because it is very true, and I have no desire whatsoever to conceal from this court the fact that to preach disaffection towards the existing system of government has almost become a passion with me. And the Advocate General is entirely in the right when he says that my preaching of disaffection did not commence with my connection with Young India, but that it commenced much earlier. And in the statement I am about to read, it will be my painful duty to admit before this court that it commenced much earlier than when the Advocate General states. And therefore, Please impose the harshest punishment on me. The accused admits in a written statement. Now, permit me to read the reaction of the judge. <coughs> you have made my task easy in one way by pleading guilty to the charge. Nevertheless, what remains? namely the determination of the just sentence, is perhaps as difficult a proposition as a judge in the country could have had to face. The law is no respecter of persons. Nevertheless, it will be impossible to ignore the fact that you are in a different category from any person I have ever tried or am likely to have to try. And it goes on and in the end the judge says, and we really pleased if you are let out on parole by the state. This is Gandhiji's trial in 1924 in Ahmedabad. So the question that I asked myself when I read this over and over again was, the judge, despite the accused pleading guilty, does not impose the harshest possible sentence. Can artificial intelligence today, at the level of sophistication that technology is today, could it have reacted the way the judge did? Possibly not today. I do not know about tomorrow. Possibly Nidhupama will tell us how far technology has gone. But if and when AI reaches this level of sophistication, I won't mind to hand over the entire justice system to machines if they can do a better job than us. Very 
very interesting perspective. Hitherto, I thought that uh, empathy has gone for a toss, or empathy is the endangered territory when machines take over. But you have added one more point. You know what it is? Discretion. So discretion uh, also will go for a toss because discretion is is also a troubled concept because uh, uh, it is it is the intervention of human reasoning which plays a role in uh, discretion, which is a byproduct of one sense of right and wrong, ethical uh, decision making. It is also a byproduct of one's experience. So it's a, it's the highest level of thinking, what Professor Bakshi calls universal trapping in the judging mind. Uh, how can you feed it into the artificial intelligence system is uh, uh, the new question that you are raising, which is, which, which, is, which is great. I mean, it's a very innovative question that you have raised. So, uh, in this context, I would uh, be interested to know what Ms. Nirupama thinks and uh, how she views it from the technological point of view. Over to you. Yeah, I think uh, being at Google, I can't be but a technology optimist. <laughs> so, I am actually very optimistic about how um, technology can affect or improve um, our profession. Um, and when we speak about technology, uh, I think like Manu and uh, Dheera said, AI is one of the subsets, right? Uh, there's automation and um, and that's where, you know, a lot of the, um, I mean, um, Mr. Dheera spoke about how um, a lot of the entry level jobs will be taken away by uh, uh, automation, right? Um, but then there's an other level which is um, AI and what AI does is it assigns or makes the machines intelligent enough to learn and predict and thereby provide um, legal decisions, right? And that's what you spoke about, about how Watson can do it now because of the supercomputing powers. And I believe that today both of these are actually underutilized by us lawyers. And where I think we all can make a difference is about thinking how we can fix this bridge. Um, especially, I, I mean, we, all of you, you set out the challenges, right? Saying it may, not, it may not be able to have the level of empathy humans have, it may not have, be able to have the discretion that, discretion that you, the humans do. And all of that is true, but then we can't stop using technology or AI because of that, right? What we need to do is figure out what the solution is or how to fix it. And um, and I believe that, um, you know, we could, I mean, this is where all of us need to think and we need to think together. And, and that's where I'm going to go off on a little tangent because what I want to do today is to kind of, um, you know, encourage prospective students, current students and legal education institutions to think about how we could contribute to this. Because instead of just passively adopting technology that comes our way, how do we contribute and make this technology? And that's where, you know, I feel there is, I feel that today we have definitely underutilized the potential of technology, be it automated machine or AI. And I believe that all of us together can actually make a difference there. And the approach I would suggest is basically uh, three E's and an I. Um, three E's being embrace, uh, educate, um, so, uh, en uh, engage, educate, sorry, embrace, educate, engage, and innovate. So, um, when I say embrace, I mean we shouldn't shy away from technology. And I think both Neeraj and Manu have spoken about how, um, you know, we have started embracing technology. Uh, there was, um, for a long time, this fear of technology amongst lawyers. But today we know that it's ubiquitous and it's an essential asset. Um, so uh, I had a friend of mine recently who is an environmental lawyer. Um, and all through law school, she felt, I, I, I mean, she was really passionate about environmental law, and she thought, you know, why should she kind of 
pay any attention to technology and what's happening in that space. But today, um, she's using, um, I mean, this is not promoting Google by any, any means, but she's actually using Google's uh, flood forecasting um, AI technology, which uses data sets to predict floods in a particular area, to kind of um, engage with the government on eminent areas where there's going to be flooding and kind of ask them to take action. So it doesn't matter if you're a civil rights advocate 